like, I understand that you're invested in school and writing, and do you plan to have a different career after you go to college? Like, what would you like to major in? Do you know yet? Well, I haven't set any definite plans as far as which college I'd like to go to or what I'd like to major in. I mean, any teenager can probably relate to me when I say that I've had many uh, ideas changing about what I want to do when I grow up. Um, you know, when I was six, I wanted to just be a writer, and since then I've added teacher and speaker and politician. Okay, maybe not, but lots of things to that list. And so when I go to college, um, I think it'll probably be somewhere along the lines of education, um, literary arts, um, possibly international relations, something having to do with more of a global scope, but definitely in those areas of the social sciences or the um, education and literature. So you seem like a normal teenager. Uh, how do you keep yourself invested in teenage life and uh, with, like, you know, like staying together with teenagers? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, I love doing a lot of things that, well, sometimes people look at me and I'm speaking up on stage and I'm really serious and everything, but they don't see what I do afterwards, which will generally be the most, you know, normal things you can imagine. I hang out with my friends, I um, post probably way too much on Facebook, and... <laughs> Um, yeah, my status updates are a little overwhelming sometimes. And um, so, yeah, I, I guess you could say that I'm sometimes as self-obsessed and, um, you know, I love going out to movies and stuff as much as anyone else. Um, do you feel overwhelmed after, you know, starting, uh, like, very successful at a very young age? Do you ever feel overwhelmed with all this? The only time that I would say I might have felt a little overwhelmed by some of the these opportunities that I've had, um, after I spoke at TED, um, at the TED conference, and my speech was watched over one million times just on TED.com, um, a couple hundred thousand on YouTube, and apparently like five million or something in China, and so suddenly people were starting to recognize me at airports, and even in Mexico City where I was on vacation with my family, which was kind of crazy, and so that, and then um, all these requests to, to have me speak in Canada, in Mexico, in Europe started pouring in, and so that was the one time probably where I felt, I wouldn't say overwhelmed, but a little bit amazed at all the uh, all these new opportunities suddenly coming at me. And then the second time, um, actually chronologically earlier, was when I went to Vietnam. This is before TED, but for some reason I was sort of a celebrity there, and I got off the plane, and I'm coming from the United States, so I'm anonymous, I walked down the street and, you know, whatever. But then suddenly there were a dozen cameras all snapping, and as I'm driving through the streets, people are asking me for autographs. That was a pretty incredible experience. And it was my first taste of being kind of famous, and I think um, I definitely don't want to be Angelina Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned you published multiple books, and I just want to know, what were your books about? Well, I published three books. My first, called Flying Fingers, is all about how to master the tools of learning through the joy of writing. and. Um, you know that as a um, as a young kid and still today, I really love reading and writing. And kind of all the learning that I do is through that. And so I wanted to show other kids writing isn't a scary thing that you have to do just for tests and for school and for teachers. This can be really fun. And so my stories are kind of quirky. They're you know historical fiction where the main character is this girl who runs away from home. It's some some stuff is sort of stereotypical, but I like to throw in plot twists and such. Really showing kids that writing doesn't all have to be serious and high and mighty. It's something that everyone can do. So really making writing approachable. That was also the goal of my second book, Dancing Fingers, which is a collection of poetry that I co-authored with my sister. And um, my third book, Young in the Sky, is a novel. And like, would we be able to find these books in a library? Yeah, um, my books are available um, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, my website. And um, some libraries, I don't think all, but definitely <coughs> check, uh, see if it's available. And if not, make a request. Yes, okay, so I'm an author. I published three books, Flying Fingers, Dancing Fingers, Young Miss Guys. I'm also a speaker. Um, some of the most notable conferences I've spoken at are the TED Conference. That's the video that got about um, over a million views. Uh, and then I've also, um, I'm also an advocate. I do a lot of uh, charity work. I've, ra I've done fundraising, and then also I'm a youth representative for the World Food Program for the United Nations. So a uh, variety of issues. And then also I'm a student and a teacher. I teach students um, classes all around the world actually every day through video conferencing. So how do you manage to like balance all that and like just keep it keep up with it in your schedule? It actually kind of surprises me how I do it too with the amount of procrastinating I do as well. But the um, I think it's kind of like any student who I'm really not that different from any student who 
is taking a full load of honors courses and extracurriculars as well. It's everyone finds a way to cope with all the different things that you do. And for me, um, I just manage the fact that I take some online classes really helps. That means I can do the traveling without worrying as much about you know missing class. And then the second thing is is um, having a lot of practice in speaking, in writing from an early age has definitely helped me so that I can do certain things, I guess, quicker and better than people who might have started just a year ago. What are some um, charities that you contribute to and what greater initiatives uh, like involving collaboration do you plan to take to improve what your goals? Well, I have a few different goals. Um, some of my main goals, empowering youth is definitely a huge one. That's what I talked about at TED, and that's what I generally do when I'm going to education conferences. So that's how I um, participate with that goal, by my speaking, um, through my advocacy. Another one is fighting world hunger, and that one I kind of stumbled into by accident. After my TED speech, I uh, connected with the World Food Program, uh, which is the UN's. You, you probably know them from the airdrops, the food, uh, emergency food for areas around the world. and so. Being able to see one of their programs in Sri Lanka firsthand, which I did last year, um, was amazing. And I, again, raised awareness for them through my speaking, school visits. And then my earliest cause that I guess I took up was improving literacy, uh, getting kids to love reading and writing. And that I also do through school visits, direct outreach to kids. So um, I use a lot of different methods, but it's most often uh, standing on the stage. You mentioned that you teach kids. Uh, like, how old are they normally? Like, I was just wondering, like, K through 12, or is it, are they normally younger or older, or do they just vary? It really does vary, because the interesting thing with the way I teach via video conferencing is that a school will request it, and it could be um, a bunch of third graders from New York, or it could be the senior class of the American School of Switzerland. So it really um, could be K through 12, as you said. Um, I will admit that it is way easier to work with elementary school kids. <laughs>
I try to live life in the present, but I'm such a pessimist sometimes that I'm always like, well, I, I wouldn't say I'm a pessimist, I would say I'm a bit of a planner and maybe an obsessive planner to some extent. Um, in, so I try to avoid thinking way too far ahead because sometimes I'll catch myself thinking, oh, what will I do when I graduate college? Now let me think about all the possible things. And I'm like, you know, that's many years away. You need to focus on the speech that you are giving tomorrow. <laughs> which you've not finished writing yet, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, I would say the, the, the future, but I catch myself doing that in the present. Do you think your, uh, Chinese and your Czech background has, like, influenced the way that you are? Wow, that is a really interesting question. I've never heard that before. Um, you know, heritage is a really interesting thing that, I think that I have a great appreciation from for my multiculturalism. Obviously, from uh, on my dad's side, I'm like actually Czech mainly, but pretty much every European thing that there is. Uh, so huge um, difference. And then also on my Chinese side, there's obviously this huge um, cultural cultural appreciation for learning, I guess, that comes with that. But I would say both my mom and my dad instilled in me that appreciation for learning, academic value, um, as well as. I think that having parents from two different backgrounds really gives you a chance to experience the world really from your birth. So do you derive your uh, motivation from competition or do you derive it from more self-fulfillment? My motivation comes from a lot of things. I guess it's, um, I wouldn't say it's really quite either just from competition or from self-fulfillment. When I go up and speak on a stage, it's not because I want to be so much better than the speaker who came before me, but it's also not because speaking makes me feel better or anything like that. I would say that I get up on a stage, I speak, I do school visits, I write a book because I like seeing the smile someone has when I autograph it for them, or the, or the person who comes up to me after a speech and says, I really loved what you said, my son went through the exact same thing and, and can really appreciate or learn from something I said. So it's more the fulfillment of others that in turn fulfills me. Has um, traveling a lot affected your social life? <laughs> Nobody thinks of that, but yes, it totally does. Um, yeah, traveling a lot means that you, well, I was sort of bummed to miss out on this whole tree lighting ceremony that my uh, city has, but come on, when you're like, <laughs> in, you get to have an ocean view instead of a tree lighting ceremony, I think it's a fair trade off. Um, so I would say the opportunities definitely outweigh the, the um, stuff I've missed out on, but yeah, I've missed out on a few people's birthday parties and stuff like that, but um, it's really hard to compare that to, hey, I've been to eight countries, <laughs> um, which sounds really selfish, but it's sort of true. Do you think um, you traveling to more countries, whether being poor or rich, has helped you value, value your, what you have and what your life is more? I would say definitely travel gives me a greater appreciation for what I have because, I mean, on one hand, I can go to a place like the Ritz-Carlton and have them bang man, when I go up, I want to be rich enough to buy this entire hotel, but then on the other <laughs> hand, um, and actually like that, I went, I had the opportunity to really briefly go to Monaco last year, and Monaco is, I mean, this is Monte Carlo and the really high rollers and stuff, and I'm walking by Hermes and, you know, window shopping, but then from Monaco and Italy and Dubai, I went to Sri Lanka, and it was like, and this was for the World Food Program, so seeing the feeding operations, students who were malnourished and who had finally, because they were getting food, were able to go to school, and the contrast was really what taught me a great deal. Um, my being able to travel a bit in India and Sri Lanka definitely taught me a lot about um, appreciating what you have and being okay with being kind of, I guess, uh, we. I might think of myself as middle class in the United States, but then when I compare my life to those of some of the people that I had the opportunity to meet, I am up there, you know, with the, um, I guess, the high rollers of the world. So looking at oneself as a global citizen instead of just American or just Washingtonian uh, was one of the most valuable things I could have gotten. So in other words, that like kind of influences you, like it like ignites your flame even more to help people. Definitely. Yeah, travel does that. Um, it makes you really committed to what you can do for everyone around the world and not just yourself. Do you have any regrets about your life so far? Do I have any regrets about my life so far? Um, hmm. That's a very good question. Um, hmm. You know, one thing I guess I regret was that 
Uh, well, I've never been to summer camp before, uh, and actually I think I'm going this year, but it's funny how my travel, as you mentioned with this whole social life interchange, there's definitely pros and cons to everything, but I would say that on the on the overall, I've gotten so many more opportunities from everything that I've done that I really don't have that many regrets at all. Um, what was your biggest obstacle or risk that you've ever taken so far? Biggest obstacle or risk? Probably, hmm, I've taken a few risks. Um, one time I was speaking at a conference in Canada, and I made the mistake of not finishing my presentation until the morning of my speech, and then running in, bringing it in on a flash drive. Uh, expectedly, one of the videos didn't work, so I actually jumped off stage, ran through the audience, <laughs> to the back of the room, to the tech booth to try to fix it. It didn't work, so I just ran back up and started improvising wildly. That would definitely so I'm just curious, uh, with all the stuff that you've done, do you plan to start your own foundation? And if you do, what would it be for? I'm somewhat interested in possibly starting a nonprofit organization, a foundation. Um, it would most likely be for um, inspiring young people, empowering young people to take uh, to make changes in communities, um, to have an impact, and I would really like to solidify some of the big ideas that I hear at conferences and take them to a local level and really see them happen. So that is not, that's, that would be kind of, um, I guess, what a possible nonprofit would be for. It would definitely be around youth, around activism, um, but I haven't finalized any plans. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned that you've been to multiple conferences. I just wanted to know, like, what initially got you known to, that they, people were reaching out for you to speak at their conferences? Well, I have to credit my mom for a lot of the media awareness because she's been like a master publicist and manager and pretty much every, she's she's worn many hats, but she would be, you know, calling up the television station telling them, hey, there's a seven-year-old presenting at this school, and so, you know, one newspaper article or one TV story, and that would really help spread the word and help me spread my message. So definitely um, the power of the media cannot be understated. Uh, one person might hear about it passed along to someone else. Then also the fact that um, as... As I have so many roles, I can go to an education conference and speak with educators, just as I could go to, say, TED and, um, you know, a more general interest conference, I suppose. The fact that I'm pretty diverse in my roles has allowed me to connect with lots of people. So that's definitely helped me. It's been a little, it's been almost 20 minutes. What do I want to be remembered for? Um, I know what I don't want to be remembered for. <laughs> That's so negative. I'm sorry. You can tell kind of what sort of personality I have. Um, Hi. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, when someone asks me what kind of music do you like, I always start with, well, I rule out everything. But the, um, that I don't like. I think um, I want to be remembered as someone who, well, let me, okay, let me think of some words I'd like to be described as, and maybe that can help me circle back to what I'd like to be remembered for. I would like to be respected, and I would also like to be someone who my great, great, great grandchildren can say, my great, great, great grandmother was a Doris Sweetalk. And so, not necessarily famous, but I guess known? Okay, so, I would like to be remembered for making a positive impact on the lives of uh, young people on, um, I think actually all people, you know, change that, uh, even though my work is mainly with other students in school. Um, I'd like to have a greater impact. Uh, definitely a great educator, um, a great writer, definitely a great writer. If I'm not remembered as a great writer, that would be really sad to present day me. And, um, yeah, I guess a writer, an educator, and, um, yeah, someone who had an impact.
and I decided I wanted to, for the rest of my life, make kids like reading and writing. Now, that goal has evolved a little bit since I was five years old, but it's been at the heart of a lot of what I've done with my publishing books, um, speaking on various conference stages, and uh, here at the Big Ideas Fest. Okay. So, um, do you think your parents influenced you more or less, or do you think it was yourself that really drove you? The whole nature versus nurture question. Um, well, I think that if my parents had not been as supportive as they were from an early age, I could see definitely where I would not be where I am today if my parents had said something differently, had raised me any differently. For one thing, they definitely read to my sister and me a lot. I know that a lot of people's parents do that, but they would read books that were really interesting, didn't say that book's too grown up for you, or, you know, stick with your grade level. Always constantly challenging, not really pushing, but, um, you know, making sure that we were interested. And then the second thing was, they were very progressive about letting us do things that seemed grown up. So when I marched up to them and said, I want to publish a book, they didn't tell me, wait until you're older. And I think that's, th those are two examples that really show.